If you would, you can turn over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to begin reading here in just a few moments uh, at verse 1 as we consider this morning another lesson uh, in our lesson, about, uh, lesson series about ki- the kingdom. We're talking about the kingdom of God and just to kind of translate that for those of you who've not been part of this series, we're talking about the church. We're talking about those who have given their lives to Christ, those who've said in their hearts and in their actions and their words and all that they do, I am yours and you are mine. I have become a child of God and I've determined to live like a child of God in this world. I, like Christ proclaimed, want to give God that love that is defined by me giving all of myself in sacrificial type of ways to him. See, that's what it means to be in a kingdom. It means that you have a king, and that king requires all of who you are. He requires your service. He requires your words. He requires your actions. He requires even down to your attitudes and the condition of your hearts, or what we might call your intents or your motives. And that's kind of what we want to talk about this morning, because that's what Jesus Christ talked about in the book of Matthew. In chapter 6, in those first four verses, he talks about the idea of not just being part of the kingdom, but being kind of all in the kingdom, and then he gets into this real specific sense about how devoted we must be to the kingdom of God. If you ever go back and you read the Sermon on the Mount, now if you're unfamiliar with that term, or if you just know it kind of loosely, realize that the Sermon on the Mount takes up Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7. If you go back and you read that section of Scripture you'll realize that most of what is said there can be put into one of two camps. And this is not my phrase, it's somebody else's phrase, and I've borrowed it, and they probably borrowed it from somebody else. But there's an old saying about the Sermon on the Mount that goes like this. The Sermon on the Mount is kingdom principles and Pentecost pointers. In other words, everything that Christ says here points to the time of the establishment of the kingdom And then once the kingdom is established, how you should live in that kingdom. And that's why we're talking so much about it. And that's why when we go to camp this week, we're going to talk a lot about that there and how to be engaged with God, how to get plugged into who He is and to who His people are, and to really get things going spiritually in in our lives. Because that's what God wants. Anything short of that is met with not just simple resistance on God's part, but disgust. Now you think about that for a minute. What do you mean? How's God disgusted? Well, I don't know. I mean, if you go to the book of Revelation there, when he talks about those people who aren't fully committed to him, and he says things like, I spew you out of my mouth, that doesn't exactly sound like God is real happy with us. But it's even down to the point where we're talking about our intentions and our motives for doing things. Let me kind of demonstrate you this by demonstrate this for you by telling you just just a little story. I grew up in the small town of St. Clairsville, Ohio, across the river from Wheeling, West Virginia, where I was born. And for most of my early childhood, I really didn't leave that area too much. Later on, I would travel many, many different places, even into some different countries. But for the most part, when I was a child, I grew up in that area. And in the middle of the Ohio River is what is called Wheeling Island. It's part of West Virginia, and that's where my grandparents lived. And there was one way on, and there, well, there was two ways on and two ways off of the island. One of them went to Ohio, and the other one went to West Virginia. And if you crossed over to the West Virginia side... You would come almost immediately to a red light, and on the corner of that corner of that intersection where the red light was, there was an old shop that had the wooden Indian, and he stood there holding cigars, and we'd drive by there all the time. But one door down was an old theater. It was one of these theaters that you go in and you just look, and I mean, the theater itself is the show. They have ornate woodwork all over the place, and the ceiling is this vaulted ceiling with this gilded leafwork. 
It was only years later that I found out that one of my relatives was actually partly responsible for doing some of that. But in that theater, I had a friend that worked while I was in high school. And the theater was primarily used in the years in which I was high school to have concerts for bands that maybe are a little past their time, but, you know, could still draw some of a crowd because it wasn't a very big theater. Uh, you might, some of you might recognize groups like, you know, Three Dog Night. I think, uh, you, know, you know, by the time they were playing in this theater, it was actually Two Dog Night. You know, you know, but, but, I mean, they, they were playing, right? Well, there was a show that my friend had to work and I was talking to him on the night, uh, on the day, uh, that the night he had to work, and the show was Eddie Rabbit, probably another name that many of you will not know. But he had to go and work this show, Eddie Rabbit, and he said, well, tonight we've got to go and we've got to, uh, you know, we've got to give the ovation. And I thought, well, what does that mean, give the ovation? They had this tradition among the ushers, which is what my friend was. When the show would finish, they would all stand up as ushers and they would walk halfway down the theater and they would stand there and clap as loud as they could. And I thought, man, that's great. What an encouragement to these acts that are still going and, and they like, still put on a show and he gets the crowd going and works them up and all of that. And I thought, man, that's a great thing. Until my friend uttered the next two statements. He said, yeah, if we stand there long enough and we clap loud enough, then the band will play long enough for us to get over time. And, <laughs> and I thought, how disappointing is that? But you see, that's the way a lot of people approach Christianity. It's kind of more about what I can do. I mean, I'm sure, you know, they're there, they're clapping, they look like they love the music. They look like they're trying to be encouraging, and that was my first thought. They look like they're trying to, to, to really let that artist know that they're doing a great job. But in their hearts, it's really nothing more than about the money. Let's get a little overtime while we're here. See, when it comes to God's kingdom, we, we can't be people who stand in the aisles and cheer for, for money. It's not about who, who we are. It's not about getting approval from mankind. It's not about some earthly or worldly payoff. It's about instead coveting God's approval. I turn over to the book of Matthew. Matthew in chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to read, uh, read verse 1. We're going to start there. And we're going to go down through just about verse, uh, verse 4. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful, Christ says, not to practice your righteousness in front of people in order to be noticed by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't blow the trumpet before, <clears throat> before you like the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they will be praised by people. I tell all of you with certainty that they have their full reward. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that when you're giving, that, so that your giving may be done in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now Christ here gives us a number of different principles. And I just want to point out a couple of different things about this particular context. About what Christ is really emphasizing. There's some language in here that's just a little bit odd, a little bit funny. So we're going to clarify just a little bit. And we're going to point out at least three different things things. Three different things. The first of which, very simply, is this. That when it comes to this kingdom, when it comes to the kingdom of God, it's not about us promoting ourselves. Now you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I don't promote myself. You know, I don't put my name on the sign out front. You know, I don't put, you know, I, I'm not my, you know, always the, the bulletin hound or the email hound or, or want my name here or put it up in lights. And that would be the extreme version of this. But it can be done amongst us, each and every one of us, in very small ways. We can get into it almost without us noticing what is going on. This habit or this ability or this, call it a trend or whatever you want to call it, to self-promote. Notice what Christ says first. He says, be careful not to act your righteousness before men. To be seen 
by them. Now, you'll notice, if he would have just stopped there and said, be careful not to act your righteousness before men, then we'd have a real problem, wouldn't we? Because that would kind of contradict some passages that Christ would utter elsewhere. For instance, when he would say things like, let your light shine. You know, you're like the city that's set on a hill shining bright. Or even go back, you know, go forward in your Bible to the last passage in, in the book of Matthew. Where he talks about, go into all of the world and make disciples. Teaching them, baptizing them. How are you supposed to do that if you can't let your righteousness be seen before men? You see, it's not just about being seen here. Notice that little phrase in this verse. He says, to be seen by them. Now, again, that just doesn't mean, well, people saw me and that's a good idea. He's talking about motives here. He's talking about you in your pride receiving the praise of mankind solely for the idea or the ability to receive that praise. Now, don't get me wrong. All of us like to feel accepted, right? And all of us like to feel accepted. Uh, all of us want to have that kind of approval. And I think each and every one of us instinctively want to be liked by people. We want other people to look at us and say, that's a good guy. They're a good person. They're sweet in their disposition, or on and on. You know, we want them to say good things about us because we want them to like us from the time our, our children is, our, our little kids. They seek our approval. Dad, watch this. Or Mom, guess what I learned at school today? And they come home and they tell us these things as if we've never heard them. Do you realize that, you know, back in history, did this happen? You know, I've known that, known it for years, since I was that big. It's not about the knowledge. It's not about the information. It's about them wanting our approval and wanting to be liked. We move forward from the time that they're very young into the teenage years, and this really doesn't change too much. We just call it different things. It moves from mom and dad's approval to popularity. And we use that word popular. Who's popular? Who's not popular? And really, it's just kind of different versions of the same thing. Whether you are in that group of conformists or whether you are in the group of nonconformists, whether you wear the leather jacket or the letterman's jacket or whatever jacket you wear, it's all different brands of the same idea. We want to be approved. We want folks to like us. Even the folks who say, well, I'm not going to conform to any group are conforming to the group of nonconformists because they want to be liked. Even as adults, as we grow, we think of these things at times. Well, you know, I don't want to let my grass grow too long because, you know, what would the neighbors think? Well, I don't want to do this, you know, because what would the people at you know, work think? And, you know, part of this is all very good. I mean, we ought to be concerned about what people think of us. But by the same token, Christ warns us that this shouldn't be our motive for doing things. At the heart of it all should not be the motive, well, how can they praise me? Or how can I get something out of this? Or some other selfish purpose. Instead, it ought to ought to be, it ought, it ought to ought to be, wow, that's kind of weird. It ought to be about how can I glorify God? Now, I'm not saying that just as kind of a throw it out there, let you absorb it, and it's one of those things that, you know, you just sort of catch and release, kind of like, you know, the Bible class questions where God, Christ, or, or you know, Jesus got to be the answer. This is a very real concept that we're supposed to absorb and come to know and, and understand. When we say these things, we have to realize that we're talking about the core of who we are. So I'm not talking about just what you do, what you say. I'm talking about the motive behind it. What is in your heart? To give the kind of the biblical illustration of this, Paul would talk about in his ministry that there are plenty of people who preach Christ. There are some who preached Christ, not with the intention of glorifying him, but you remember what Paul says? With the intention of doing Paul harm. Now, I don't know what that whole scenario was, and the Bible doesn't really spell it out. But Paul tells us that their motive wasn't to do good things by preaching the word of Christ. 
Now, Paul did say at least the word got preached, but he tells us that their motive was wrong. Their motive was to cause him hardship in his time of affliction. So what is it that is in our heart when we do the things that we do? Notice what Christ is talking about here. He's not talking about things that are bad, things that are evil. Go back to the passage and read. Be careful not to practice your righteousness. We're not talking about things that are inherently sinful here. We're talking about you doing things that are good. Paul, or not Paul, Christ could have very well said, you know, when you're praying, or when you're helping somebody out, when you're going over here, like we do, Ronald McDonald House. When you go down to the Ronald McDonald House and you're cooking you know, for people. Or when you go over here and you're building this house for people. Or you're traveling to this other country and you're preaching the message there. Or you're going up, to, well, we're going to camp, right? When you go up to camp and you're doing those good and righteous things there, that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about things that are inherently bad. As a matter of fact, we look at them and we think, well, those things are far from bad. So how could they be bad? See, the rightness or the wrongness of it is determined by the condition of our heart with which we enter that task. Be careful, he says. Don't use these things as an attempt to covet the approval of men. Everybody knows what the word covet means, right? Covet is a word that kind of has a bad, you know, sort of connotation to it. But, you know, in the biblical language of things, it, it, it's not really that way. You know, covet is kind of like the word lust. We, we put a bad kind of spin on it in, in our modern language. But both those words, lust and covet, in the New Testament, are, are words that were very neutral. Based upon the context, they could be either good or bad. You can covet the good things in life, or you can covet the bad things in life. And ironically enough, those two words share a common root. And that common root very simply means to strongly desire something. Now, you and I both know that you can strongly desire some bad things, some harmful things. But then we can also strongly desire some things that are very, very helpful. And very, very good for us. Christ tells us, you know, make sure that when we do these things, the idea is that we are coveting, that we are desiring with a great strength the approval that God has to offer. I like the way that Eugene, Eugene Peterson's uh, version of the Bible, and it's not one that I recommend for study, but it's called The Message. I do like the way that it renders this passage. He says this, Be especially careful when you are trying to do good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. When you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself, he says. Now turn over in your Bibles, just very quickly. Turn over in your Bibles to the book of uh, Mark. To the book of Mark. And in chapter 12, verse 41, we want to notice a verse there as well. Mark chapter 12. I'm just going to notice very quickly verse 41. <clears throat> this is the passage about the widow's offering. He said, And he sat down opposite the treasury, and he watched people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. Now you remember how the story goes, right? You remember how then along comes this poor widow. This poor widow, and, and she puts in, you know, what today would be even less than a penny. Less than a penny. And then, of course, Christ uses that as an example. Down in verse 43, he says, Truly I say to you, the poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. But you'll notice that verse. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched people putting money in the offering box. And many rich people put in 
large sums. Picture that scene in your head for just a second. It's not a scene that we're used to, right? See, because when we pass a plate around, we, you know, typically everybody will fold their check and stick it in. They'll fold their bills and they'll stick them in the plate. And nobody really knows how much anybody here gives, unless you're the guy who gets to count the money. See, there was a box in the temple complex. And it was in one of the courtyards that was outside, of course, that section where they would conduct that worship service. But it was in a rather large courtyard. And people would have to come by and they would have to place their money in the box. And anybody could sit there, like Christ and his disciples did, and watch people put money in the box. But even still, how do you think that Christ knew how much money they were putting in? Now, the Bible doesn't really spell it out for us. But if I had my guess, based upon knowing the lessons of Christ and knowing some of the scathing criticism that he gives these leaders and the rich folks of his day, that they, much like people today, made a show of it. Lifted themselves high. Interrupted what was going on around them so that they could promote their own name and lift themselves up. You can just about imagine that the guy whose great wealth is just uh, overflowing and amassing. Here he comes with his carriage and his horses and he's got all of these things full and he walks up to the box and he's got servants and the servants are streaming out and they're making a big presentation and putting the money in the box. How do we know that? Because that's the tendency of human beings. Go to any hospital and you're going to find that this is the case. Well, not any hospital, but most of them. Go to a hospital. Somewhere in that hospital, there's going to be a wall. And on that wall is going to be a bunch of plaques. And on that plaque is going to be a bunch of names for people who have given. And there might be entire wings of hospitals named after so-and-so who gave such amount of money. Go to universities, even our Christian universities, and you're going to find this hall and that hall and this hall. And I'm not really picking on all of that. I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that, if the motive is right. But it's the tendency of man to want to use these things, that wealth, our gifts, our service, our righteousness, to call attention to us rather than calling attention to God. See, it's more about me. It's more about what I did. It's more about what I accomplished than it actually was about something that God did. In Matthew 22, in Matthew chapter 22, <clears throat> in verse 16, it says this, we know you are a man of integrity. Speaking to Christ, these religious leaders say this. A man of integrity in that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You are not swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Now your version might read a little differently. But essentially what it teaches is that, you know, Christ very often drew people to himself because the people understood very clearly that, number one, his words had a higher purpose and meaning. That, number two, higher purpose took you beyond who he was as a person and led you straight to God and the glorification of him. Now, that really made some people mad. But it also cause certain people to draw to him and to come close and to actually want to learn of the things that he was trying, trying to teach. So Christ warns us about being self-promoting, but then he tells us about the way of the self-promoted. You'll notice that if you go back and you read again in Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, he says, so whenever you give to the poor, don't blow the trumpet before you like the hypocrites do in the synagogues. Christ says basically this, if you're the self-promoting kind, 
if you're serving God and it's really more about you than it is actually about God, then you're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. Now, we could spell this out in a number of different ways, but I'll put it to you the simplest way I know how. When you become a child of God and you say, I'm going to live a righteous life, and you go into the waters of baptism, submitting to his will completely, then you put off you and you put on him. So anything we do after that point that is motivated selfishly and promotes self above his will is like us putting back on the mask of the old man. That's essentially what Christ is saying. Don't put on the mask of the hypocrite. Don't put on the mask of the Pharisee and parade around the synagogues and make people think this about you when actually it's something totally different. Christ has a lot to say about hypocrisy. You remember one of the most scathing rebukes is that which he gives to the, to the Pharisees in places like Matthew chapter 23. And in that particular section, he, he's going to call them things like Brood of vipers. Brood of vipers. And you know, it's an interesting image, and we kind of think about it, and we say, well, danger. You know, stay away. But there's a little more to it than that. Brood of vipers, hypocrites. Do snakes just come and lay by your front door so you can walk over them every day? Are they always there in those obvious places where you see them? I tell you one thing, the first year we were here, First year we were here. Now we have snakes where we came from in Ohio, but first year we were here, I was out in the backyard cutting the grass. Cutting the grass and got the little tire, sweat on the brow, went to get my drink that was hanging off the fence in a water bottle, put my hand on the fence like this, and the fence moved. That's a creepy feeling. When the fence is moving underneath of your hand, right, I was expecting in the next second fangs to be sticking out of my hand. Turns out it was just this black racer that was sunbathing on the fence, right? But it kind of matched the, the fence. Snakes don't hang out in obvious places at times. Sometimes you've got to roll that old log, and there they are. Sometimes you reach under that whatever it is that's sitting in the backyard, and lo and behold, there it is. They're danger, but it's a danger that is typically hidden. He also calls them whitewashed tombs. Outside, looks great. Inside, dead men's bones. See, that's who you become. When you profess Christianity, when you say, I'm in the kingdom, I believe in the kingdom, I believe in God, I believe in all of these things, and, and yet at the same time, your heart is saying, it's all about me approving me, it's all about other men approving me, not about God's approval. Not about him saying, good job, well done, good and faithful servant. Just a couple of final passages in our last point. Christ warns us about self-promoting. He tells us about the way of the self-promoter. It's the way of the hypocrite. But then finally, he tells us that there's motivation for you to give God glory in all things and to seek his approval rather than men's and rather than your own. There's reward. Go over to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And we're just going to, for the sake of time, we're just going to read verse 27. <clears throat> The Son of Man is going to come with his angels in his Father's glory, and then he will repay everyone according to what he has done. That is, according to what you have done. Now, go, go over to Matthew chapter 19. Go to Matthew chapter 19. And we're just going to read verses 19 and uh, 20. <clears throat> He says, honor your mother and father, and you shall, uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, yeah, yeah, uh, 29 and 30, sorry. I said it wrong, it's right on the board. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. 
But many who are first will be last, and the last first. A couple more passages. Over to Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, just notice uh, verses 7 uh, and 8. Uh, I tell you what, I, we'll take the time. Start at 5, and we'll read down to it. Paul's writing, he says, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the start, rendering service with goodwill as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free doesn't matter who you are, whether you're the highest in society or whether you're the lowest on the rung of society, which would have been the bond servant. You need to do all things, not to please men, but to please God and seek his approval. Last passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> We're just going to read verses 12 through 15. 12 through 15. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day uh, will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. You see, there's a great reward that is coming. There's a couple of preachers that I like to, to listen to from time to time, and, and um, recently listened to a guy by the name of Timothy Keller, or Keller, I guess you would say it. And he told this story about two guys put in a room. And their entire job was essentially reduced to the idea of folding this sheet of paper into four, four different times. Fold it this way, fold it this way, fold it that way, fold it this way. And that's what they had to do. It didn't matter what was on the paper. All they were doing was folding the paper. Two guys in the room, eight hours a day, folding each piece of paper four times. Same way every single time. Two hours into the project, the one fella stood up and said, I can't stand it anymore. It's driving me crazy. Who could do work like this? Gets up, walks out. The other fellow left behind, smiles as he watches his friend walk out the door, turns back, speaking to no one in particular, and he says, boy, I love my job. And then Keller reveals there's a difference between the two men. The first was simply working for minimum wage paid at the end of each day. The second was working for a million dollars paid at the end of the year. You see, there's a reward. And there are some things worth doing that pay great dividends. But there is nothing that will profit you greater than giving your life, including your heart and your motives and your intentions, Nothing that will pay you more than becoming and remaining and living fully connected, fully engaged as a child of God. In his kingdom, subject to the king, each day live for him. What does it profit a man is the question that Christ would ask in another context. And the answer, of course, is there's profit in nothing else. And that's kind of the point. Christ, when he told us to, for instance, give, he said, give so that your left hand, so that your one hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing. In other words, give and then forget it. Because it's not about you. Give with a good heart. Give with an honest heart. Give willingly, not by compulsion, but give and then let it go.
The same thing is true for the whole of your life. When we give our lives, we let them go, and we give them to God. Well, maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're here and in that position where you know what you need to do. You know that it's time. You've heard his word, and, and you believe. That belief being a strong conviction that is inside of your heart is telling you that you need to repent of your sins, confess the name of Christ. And you may even picture yourself this morning standing on the edge of the waters of baptism. And you know that in that water, not that it has anything to do with the water, but you know that that is the place where you come in contact with the blood of Christ and God washes you clean as you submit to him. Why not take that step today? And maybe you've done that. And maybe you're here in, in a position where you've not been true to that. Or maybe you're just struggling with something. Maybe you just simply need prayers. That invitation that we offer now is for all of those things. For any need that you might have, please make it known as together we stand and sing.